Welcome back inside the Big Tire Garage for another one of our Q&A sessions. Now, by now, I'm sure you've all figured it out, or if you haven't and you're new, here's how it works. Ask a question on any of my videos. I randomly select some questions to answer here. If I choose your question, you simply email me your name and your mailing address to bigtiregarage at gmail.com. I drop a sticker pack in the mail and send it out to you. For those of you looking to buy stickers, I'll put a link in the description below. We've got stickers for sale. We also now have patches and we have another new sticker in the works from my friends at Sketch My Ride for the Colorado, which is the Colorado that I built and then took on Ultimate Adventure. Anyway, here we go. We're gonna jump right in. Let's start things off with question number one is Javin by B4822. I'm wondering about wheel diameter and width. What's best for, let's say, a 37 by 12 5 inch tall tire? I'm wanting to do 15s on my Toyota, but I'm also leaning towards 17s due to the availability. Is there a big downside to larger wheels? Okay, so let's start off with just the description of, uh, you know, the wheel itself. So if we're looking at a 37 inch tall tire, what we really want to look at when we look at wheel size is how much sidewall am I going to have? When we're off-roading, what we do is we air the tire down. So that means we let a little bit of air out of the tire, even on a non-beadlock wheel. What we would do is take it from a street pressure of let's say 32 to 35 PSI, depending on the vehicle. And if it's a non-beadlock wheel, drop it down to maybe 15, uh, depending on the weight of the car. Once again, if it was a really light vehicle, you may go down a little bit further, maybe down to 10 or 12. And what that does is it all, it basically acts as like an additional shock absorber in your suspension system, because as you're driving over the little bumps and stuff in the road, what happens is instead of all of that energy being transmitted directly into the suspension, the actual sidewall almost becomes a small spring. Uh, the other benefit to airing down off-road is that you increase the contact patch of the tire. So as you let that air out, the actual contact patch of the tire grows, therefore putting more traction to the ground, but also more importantly, it actually makes it easier on the environment that we're wheeling in because there's a greater chance that you'll conform to the rocks or the dirt instead of basically spinning it up or kicking it out. So that's why we air down. The question he's asking is about tire size. So on a 37, you know, a great wheel honestly is a 17. A 37 on a 17 or a 40 on a 17, that gives you almost the optimum aspect ratio between the wheel and tire itself to get a really good sidewall. A 15 would also work, you just end up with a lot more sidewall and you may think, well that's going to be better because if I have more sidewall and I air the tire down, I have even more of a shock absorber in the system. But it doesn't work that way. The more sidewall you have, actually you can become slightly uh, unstable off-road because on that 15 inch wheel, you have so much more sidewall that what happens is when you air that tire down, the wheel is now actually able to move inside that tire and you can actually sometimes feel the vehicle be a little bit unstable. A 15 and a 35, oh, that would work great. That's a great combo. You do need to be careful though when you're looking at 15 inch wheels uh, for things like clearancing on your brakes and or your tie rod because a lot of the axles that we're swapping into our vehicles never came from the factory with a 15. They always came with like 16s, 17s, 18s, or sometimes even 20s. So if you are planning to run a 15 inch wheel on something like, I don't know, say a 99 to 04 Dana 60, there's probably gonna be some issues with clearancing on the brakes as well as on the tie rod itself. And really the only solution there is to go to a larger wheel, partially because the aluminum wheels are sometimes a little bit thicker than a steel wheel. Um, you could make it work. We used to, when we used to run a lot of 15 inch wheels on stuff, we would grind calipers to make it fit. But really, there's so many 17s out there. It's just a great wheel size. Honestly, for me, a 17 is great for a 35 to a 37 to a 40. 
Uh, you'll notice that the 42s, a lot of the 42 inch tall tires that uh, a lot of the tire manufacturers are offering right now, they're offering those in 20s and that's to keep that perfect sidewall to tire ratio. I think if you did a 42 on a 17, as I said before, that's a lot of sidewall to move around. Not saying it can't be done, I'm just saying you have to be ready for that. That's a lot of sidewall to be kicked around. Now width is another thing, but in all honesty, you're kind of going to be just handcuffed with the tire options that you have available. So most of the time what's going to happen is on a 35, 12, 5, it's going to end up on maybe a, a 9, 9.5 or 10 inch wide wheel. That's probably going to be the most popular size you're going to find. Uh, and that's really a good fit, you know, 37 on a 17 by 9.5 or 17 by 10. Um, that's a really good fit, 17 by 9 as well. That'll allow the sidewall to basically be pulled around and that helps keep the bead seated because if you look at the tire from the front, it's like a, almost like a little heart shape because the wheel, the tire is basically trying to push out on the wheel and that's what helps keep the bead seated. What you don't want is a wheel so wide that the tread is flat and then the, the sidewall is basically stretched out. You'll see that in a lot of the... I guess they're called bro dozers nowadays, but basically that, that total mall look, big jacked up diesel truck, they basically stretch the tire out. That's a look they're going for. That is not ideal for off-road because that tire is trying to de-bead. It's trying to pull itself in. So it's not the best scenario in that. So the answer for your 37 inch tall tire is yes, 17 is a great wheel. Um, one thing you do need to pay attention is the offset of that wheel. The offset is going to be the location of the uh, mounting flange of the wheel as it relates to the center of the wheel. So, you know, you have a negative or a positive offset that'll move the wheel either further in or further out. Uh, and the best thing to do is to, if you can, get a, a, a gate, you can get a gauge that will basically bolt on to the hub and it'll set the tire and you can play around that offset if you want. If you find a set of wheels that you like that's a 17, 9, 9.5 with a zero offset, it's a pretty safe bet for most of the off-road vehicles out there. We don't really have to worry about tires sticking out normally in an off-road car because we kind of want that because when you get off a rock and you slide down, you kind of want the tires to get into the rocks before like the doors and the fenders and the rocker panels. Um, that offset really comes into play when you're building things like street cars, where you want to get the tire up underneath the fender and yet still have clearance for everything. So yes, is there a drawback to a larger wheel? Uh, yes, if you go really large, like a 37 with, I don't know, say like a 22 inch wheel, it's not the best off-road wheel option, but 37, 17, that is a great choice. And uh, thanks for your question. I hope there's a little bit of wheel tech in there to help you out. All right, next question is from Jeep Guy, 1337. It seems most off-road rigs are automatics. Any pros or cons to having a manual or standard transmission is what he called it. Okay, it's a really good question because I have a personal preference and I know other people who have a personal preference and I think that is honestly the first answer, personal preference. There's a lot of people out there who love sticks off-road. Myself, I'm not a huge fan of the manual transmission. Uh, and I'll, let's explain, let's explain why. So let's start with um, the difference between the automatic and the manual in off-road situations. So the automatic, uh, as you know, is an automatic transmission. What's behind the engine is a torque converter. And that torque converter, basically, it's a fluid coupling device. And it's kind of hard to explain, but if you want to visualize how a torque converter works, uh, here's literally the easiest way to do it. That's how I used to explain it to uh, students in high school. So get two fans, just regular household fans. And if you take one fan and turn it on and put another fan beside it, the air that's coming off of the first fan will start turning the second fan. Just that's basically what's happening because it's pushing air and it's hitting the blades and it's causing it to spin. Uh, just like wind on a wind turbine, except you're basically creating the wind yourself. That's essentially how a torque converter works. So that big donut thing that's bolted to the back of your engine, it's attached to the engine and inside of that torque converter, there are blades and those blades are welded in at different angles. And what happens is, is as the engine starts to turn or spin, the fluid that's inside that torque converter starts to get flung around inside it. And what it does is it hits another set of blades 
And as those blades get hit by the fluid, they start to turn. That's what starts turning the input shaft of the transmission. Now, why that's important, we'll get to that in a second. An automatic, that's an automatic transmission. A manual transmission works completely differently. On a manual transmission, you have a flywheel, and then you have a clutch and a pressure plate. And the input shaft slides through the pressure plate and engages with the clutch. The clutch is the big, basically flat disc part. Uh, what happens there is the clutch is squeezed by the pressure plate into the flywheel and that is basically what locks it together. So it's a mechanical, basically a mechanical connection between the engine and the transmission. When you push the clutch in, what you're doing is you're essentially pushing a throw out bearing onto the fingers of the pressure plate and what that does is it causes the pressure plate to relax, removes that spring pressure and then that clutch that's between the flywheel and the pressure plate then is just spinning. It's just spinning because it's basically that spring pressure is gone. When you let the clutch out the spring pressure starts to release on the or sorry the throw out bearing starts to release its pressure and then it begins to push on the clutch and then eventually you'll get past basically like the slip stage where the clutch is just rubbing on the flywheel and then it catches and then it just basically grabs and it locks the two together. So you, in one case, in an automatic transmission, you have a, a hydraulic coupler attaching the engine to the transmission. And in a manual transmission, you have a mechanical connection between the engine and the transmission. So why is that a big deal off-road? Okay, first of all, let's start with just driving style. So the nice thing about the automatic transmission when you're off-road is you can be climbing a hill, push your foot on the brake, the vehicle will stop when you want to go again, push the gas, all that fluid starts spinning around inside the torque converter, engages the transmission, and up the hill you go. The manual transmission, what has to happen is you have to put it in gear, let your foot off the clutch, the minute you put, lift your foot off the brake to let your foot off the clutch, what happens? The vehicle begins to roll backwards. So you do put a little bit extra wear and tear on that uh, clutch assembly if you drive a lot off-road because essentially you're slipping it a lot when you're climbing up uh, big nasty ledges. Uh, the nice thing about the manual transmission, I guess essentially you can pick whatever gear you want. So if you wanted to climb a hill and you want a lot of wheel speed, you could honestly put it in third gear. If the engine has enough power, you rev it up, dump the clutch, and you'll be in third gear. You can achieve that same thing with an automatic by installing a manual valve body, which means that whenever you put it, whatever, whatever gear you put it in will be the gear that you start in, and therefore you'll get a little bit more stall. Um, some people like a, a, a loose torque converter in their off-road rig and that means that when you let off the brake the, the vehicle rolls back a little bit until you get your RPM to a certain stall speed. So you can change the stall speed of that torque converter so you can have that benefit of rolling backwards without having to put the vehicle in reverse, reverse if you have a higher stall speed torque converter. Um, so that's where it's kind of personal preference. Now let's talk about one of the reasons why I think an automatic is better. I feel that the automatic is better because of that hydraulic coupler between the engine and the transmission. You will find in an automatic vehicle that there is less shock load to the overall drivetrain if you are um, on the throttle and hit a big rock or some, there's a shock to the drivetrain, the torque converter can actually soak up a little bit of that shock because it almost acts like a shock absorber because it's just fluid attaching the two. If you are in a manual transmission vehicle and you're climbing a big ledge and you slip off it and you don't get your foot on the clutch fast enough, the entire vehicle is still locked, that whole entire drivetrain is still locked together and so when that tire hits, it's still under load trying to go forward because you're in whatever gear you're trying to go in. And it can put a little bit of additional shock load into the drivetrain. Um, there are some other benefits to the manual. In all honesty, the manual isn't going to run as hot off-road. Uh, usually a manual, no matter what, unless you completely burn the clutch out, and even then if you burn the clutch out, you're just going to be in gear all the time. You can get the manual home no matter what. 
you burn up an automatic on the trail, you're not going anywhere. That's just the truth of it. Um, if you cook the clutches in an automatic, you get a box full of neutrals. You cook the clutch in your manual, you still have all your gears, you just don't have the ability to disengage it from the engine. So you can still technically drive it out of the woods or the desert or whatever you are to get home. Um, so it, yes, it does a lot revolves around personal preference. I can see there's benefits and drawbacks to both. I myself prefer an automatic mainly because I build a lot of automatic transmissions and I know how they work and so I'm a lot more comfortable with an automatic. I also just prefer driving an automatic. That's, that's the way I feel about it. But I think that's why you see a lot more automatics off-road. I think the technology that uh, has come into the automatic transmission, specifically in transmissions like the Turbo 400 and the 4L80, um, the strength that we can add to those transmissions, it's unparalleled in any transmission out there. You can build a bomb-proof Turbo 400 that you can abuse all day long and it will, if built correctly, will get you home no matter what. That's what's in like trophy trucks and Ultra 4 cars. It's still that automatic transmission, that Turbo 400. It's still the basis, the basis to my opinion, is the, almost the perfect off-road drivetrain. So I think that's why that automatic is so popular. So. Hopefully that answered your question. Thank you so much for asking. Remember, send me an email with your address, bigtiregarage at gmail.com, and I will get a sticker pack out for you. Here we go. Last question. Uh, Jake and the Bearded Hobo. Great name, by the way. Uh, what was your biggest fabrication fail that you didn't know until it was too late? So that's a hard question to answer because I don't think I could pick just one. I don't think there's a single fabrication fail that I could just say, oh, that one didn't work. There have been hundreds, thousands, thousands of fabrication fails um, over the years. Uh, I would say probably the biggest fabrication fail, I guess maybe would be years ago, I built a suspension system and I was trying to do a radius arm with a single pivot upper link. It just didn't work. Um, and I ended up just cutting it out and redoing it. Uh, I would say that probably my biggest fabrication fail would be any time that I was working on something and I got to a certain point and I was like, I'm really not liking how this is gonna work or look. And I didn't just pull the pin early and get out and say, I gotta redo that just for my own personal preference. I think at this point in my life, I think I'm very comfortable with just saying, that's not gonna work. I gotta cut that out and redo it. Um, and I think that just comes from experience. And I think that that's probably the biggest fabrication fail you could ever have is if you hit that wall and you know, you know when you're building something, you'll get there and you'll be like, man, I just don't think that's gonna work. Um, I think that that's a situation where you kinda just be, gotta pull the pin and say, it's just not gonna work. I guess probably, yeah, I mean, I, don't, I, I couldn't pick one. Like literally there are thousands of times in my life when I've been building something and I've just got to the point where it's just like, that's not gonna work and I would, just, uh, it'll be fine, and it's not fine, because you're never happy with it. Um, so I think that would probably be, it's just, there's too many, too many to, to answer, I guess would be the answer, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I can't answer your question, but I guess that's just it. I would say that, like I said before, that is the best decision you can make, is, is if you're building something and you feel like it's not gonna work, there's probably nine times out of 10, it's not gonna work. Just cut it out, change it, fix it, make a change, and and, and do it early. The earlier you do it, the better, because even if you push past it, you're not going to be happy in the long run. And that's just how that works. So uh, sorry I couldn't answer your question, because like I said, there's just too many options to choose from. Okay, so there we go. Those are our three questions this week. So there you go, guys. That's your answer to all the questions that we've had this week. Uh, now we're going to do the where is it now. Now somebody asked this. I can't remember where. Uh, and I'm sorry I don't have it written down. But somebody wanted to know what happened to the discount Datsun. That's a great, uh, great one. So for those of you that don't know, uh, I built that probably near my end uh, on my old TV show. I think it was like second last or second to last season that I was working on. Uh, I just had this idea. Really what I wanted to build was a Chevy Love pickup truck. And so I was kind of scoping out the internet looking for a good deal on a Chevy Love. Um, couldn't find it. Uh, I was kind of digging around here and there. Um, and then I stumbled across this little Datsun two-wheel drive, kind of a mini truck. Um, it was, it had a stack. It was a diesel, which was kind of cool, stick, and it was cheap, and so I bought it. And we basically built what I called the discount Datsun. So it was uh, a super low buck build, 
Uh, solid axle swap the front. I can't remember. I think I may have done air. I can't even remember. I think I did air shocks on it all the way around. Uh, four length the back, solid, solid axle swap the front. We did a divorced uh, uh, Suzuki Samurai transfer case. I think I got some six to one gears for it. Uh, basically put it on 40s. I think it was Yoda axles. If not, if, if it wasn't Yoda axles, I left the Datsun axle in the back and then put a Yoda axle up front. I can't honestly remember by now. It was tan, which was kind of cool. So I painted it tan, bobbed the bed really hard. And uh, then we just took it wheeling. And it was, it was kind of a, it was a fun truck because the little diesel engine didn't have enough really power to break anything. And the uh, drivetrain itself was pretty proven. You know, Yoda's Zoot case, you know, divorced. Uh, it just, it just, it just worked well. Um, where is it now? Well, it, would actually, it was actually bought by a friend of mine uh, here locally. Uh, I don't know if he still wheels it, but he was a huge uh, Datsun slash Nissan guy. And so he just wanted that truck. I have no idea why he was in love with that truck. And uh, he ended up buying it and uh, it popped up here and there every now and again. And uh, yeah, and so that's where it is. It's out on the trails. I don't think it's still out on the trails today. That was about five, six years ago. Maybe it is. I don't know. But it's uh, it was used and abused and wheeled and all kinds of fun stuff. And so there you go. That's where it is today. Discount Datsun. Still out there having fun. Super cheap. And uh, that's exactly what we did with it. And it's still being used for that today. All right, guys, thank you so much for your questions this week from here inside the Big Tire Garage. Once again, if I answered your question, go ahead and shoot me an email, bigtiregarage at gmail.com. I'll get you a sticker pack out in the mail, and we'll see you next time.